around a bit when I'm talking. All right. Gee, how do you advance this thing? The down button doesn't work. Which one is it? Uh, left, right. All right. This is a Mac, right? Yeah. All right. So my idea of standardization is everybody should use Microsoft Windows and no, no, no Mac. Okay, what I'm going to talk about, it's a little bit different than what uh, Barry said, but I need to give some essential background uh, about what happened in the past before we can go uh, talk about what's going to happen in the future. And second part will be a little bit about the actualization and what I tried to do uh, with it specifically for educational purposes for my students. Uh, I'm getting older and I had to make certain decisions. I'm trying to keep the length of my hair constant, right? That's why it doesn't look like anything. Another thing is that my brain cells are switching. So there are parts of my frontal lobe which I'm starting to use as if they were from my periotemporal lobe. So which means that I will not be politically correct and if you are easily offended, leave the room. That's a warning. So who am I? A little bit of introduction. I studied medicine in Belgium. I became a neuropsychiatrist, but while I was doing my residency, I did also uh, the equivalent of a bachelor in computer science and of a master in knowledge engineering, which was uh, in the department of philosophy there. I don't remember much of that period except one guy, uh, Professor Paul Kluiskens, he was from nose, ear and throat diseases and at some point I did something wrong and he said to me, well now you have learned for the rest of your life that never ever ask a blind person to search for a black hat in a dark room that in the first place was never there. Second phase in my life I met this guy, George de Moore. So he's the one who is actually responsible for the standardization in healthcare informatics. So we st it started out of its PhD thesis, which became um, in the United States known as LOINC. Uh, at least it was a watered. Can you, I think the, um, for some reason the lapel and mic's not working, it's hard to give you Maybe I didn't switch it up high enough. Oh, oh, Jesus. Okay. So, I've just been told that it doesn't work. Okay. So, he was uh, doing the standardization, and I worked with him in the Department of Biomedical Informatics again. I did a couple of uh, uh, European projects for him, wrote some awards for him, and then he told me, whether you are so good, you should create your own company, which I did. But he was also smart, so he became a shareholder in uh, my research company. I started to work primarily on natural language understanding for medical records. I uh, created a not-for-profit, which now uh, turned into the uh, European Institute for uh, Electronic Healthcare Records to promote the use of electronic medical records amongst hospitals and doctors. And then I created language and computing to commercialize the things we developed in office line engineering. Oops, that's too far. One of the things I did there was working on other language understanding and in those days I was already aware that you couldn't do that if you didn't have ontology. And I used two ontologies, a domain ontology about medicine, which was quite huge, and also a linguistic ontology, which was very much inspired by the work of John Bateman that some of you might know, the generalized upper model. Um, it was quite an impressive thing. I had been working in Galen with Alan Rector in England, and uh, we were all fussing about how bad ICD-9 in those days was. In those days also SNOMED CT was uh, not so good as it is now. Uh, so we created our own uh, ontology, which was huge. So already in 2000 it had over 3 million uh, what we call the uh, link type instantiations and over 900,000 concepts and it integrated ICD and SNOMED CT and MEDSYN and different kind of other systems. And we had already description logics in it as well. So if my team or one member of my team tried to uh, change something in the ontology and it didn't work out, there was an immediate warning. And then this guy came in my life. Actually on a Sunday morning. This is the very first mail that I sent to Barry 
and he answered on a Sunday that I got, I think 30 minutes later. Barry won an award in Germany, about 2 million euro. And my intelligence guy in my company told me about it, and I was so pissed. Because we, I mean, my company and our rector and guys from the Netherlands, we had tried to get European money for such a long time to build a medical ontology. And then out of the blue came Barry, who didn't know shit about medicine actually, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he got two minutes. So we sent in that mail and he was interested. We conversed for, I think, five or six more mails. He wanted to see some papers, some screenshots, and he decided to fly over. And indeed, in early January, he was standing in my office. I explained him how the system worked. He looked at it with his characteristic smile, and then came the verdict. Impressive, <laughs> but, but, but all wrong. Now, of course, I could have kicked him out, right? So. Uh, HL7 kicked him out, but that was wrong <laughs> because that stopped existing. I listened and because I thought he, he was right. So we started to have a very good collaboration. Uh, I became an advisory board member in IFOMIS, his organization there in Germany. And actually he killed my future in my company because in the years that followed, I mean, we were so able to improve our system so much that my board of uh, investors decided that we were already too much ahead of the competition. They killed my research team and I had nothing to do. So <laughs> I went with Barry to ECO, European Center for Ontological Research in, in Saarbrücken. He moved his team from Leipzig to Saarbrücken to accommodate me <laughs> so that I didn't have to travel that far, which I really much appreciate. And then in 2006, when the German money ran out, uh, he forced UB to make me an offer I couldn't refuse and I came to Buffalo and I'm still happy there since, now in the Department of Biomedical Informatics. This was the slide that convinced me, so why he was right. Um, I, my background in philosophy was not that big, knowledge engineering is too far away from philosophy, so I had a very hard time understanding certain stuff, but this made it clear. Okay. Looking through this as an ontology, looking through your uh, reality. Ontology as benchmark. I mean, that's the uh, reality as benchmark. Well, I trusted him, but Barry trusted me too, specifically in my choices of restaurants and wines. <laughs> so there was, there was a mutual trust. But the biggest thing actually is these sets of papers. And if you have not read anything of this and you are interested in biomedical informatics and ontology, please do it. This is a very early one, data and reality from, from Bill Kent, okay, which is fantastic. It is from Alan Rector, framework for modeling the electronic medical records. Importantly, this guy takes reality as benchmark. Here it is descriptions of benchmark. Well, the NQRE, you know, they have 2001 paper, supporting ontological analysis of taxonomic relations, which is more about concepts. And then much later, Barry's beyond concepts and against ontology. So if you read those, right, then you see why it is actually quite good. What do I consider as BFO's selling points? Well, those couple of distinctions between ontology and ontologies, okay, as a, as a, as a discipline or as something that is developed, representation, um, the distinction between continuance and occurrence, dependent entities, independent entities, particles, universals, um, very importantly, because later we will talk about reference tracking, which uh, is a kind of bit of the division uh, that I maintain. So I would focus on reference tracking, which is the particulars, and Barry would focus on the universals, which uh, through, is through the BFO. And now what descriptions and descriptions are about. Most importantly, need for temporal indexing. Okay. That was a major failure in, in my system, that I couldn't analyze certain text because I never thought of uh, building the temporal indexing inside of the logic. In other ways, I was a little bit ahead uh, of Barry as well. Uh, I was aware of the importance of uh, uh, temporal indexing, but not at the level of the ontology. So at the end of the 90s, I led a team for uh, CENTEC251, which is the European Center for Normalization, uh, for a standard for time-specific problems in healthcare informatics, uh, which was based on the work of different philosophers. I remember pr primarily Johan van Bentham uh, from, from the Netherlands. This thing got accepted as an ISO standard in 2019. They changed the 
words a little bit, or at least the title, but the content is exactly the same as the European standard that we designed in 97. Why it is important also? Well, that's a little joke there. Yeah. Barry, do you recognize that still? That's the old corridor of Ifomis in, in Saarbrücken. You see the door at the end there? There's a note. This door should always remain closed because of the danger of fire. And then on there, one of his guys put a little note, but how should we then get through it? <laughs> So, uh, BFO looks like a success. So, uh, that's um, Google's Ngram viewer. Um, they did that in, 19, in 2019. They didn't update it regularly, but, but you see in, in books how often basic formal ontology was, uh, was mentioned. So, it, indeed, it looks like a success. Now, however, okay, and now I come on the sad part. I have several frustrations. Not really about BFO, some of them, but not really about BFO, but specifically in relation. So one is the inappropriate reference uh, that is made to the basic formal ontology in different works uh, in the literature. So this is the last, the latest ontology disaster. It's about the disaster management ontology, published 19 May 2023. I always thought that Nature was such an important journal, published it in nature. Now please take the time to, oh well, it's maybe too small of the red bit, bits. It's in there. BFO believes that anything that exists must belong to some category of the entity group. The entity can be anything, including emotions, facts, objects, processes, qualities, models, etc. In BFO, continuance specializes all those entities that preserve their identity throughout the state of living. These entities preserve their identity even while they obtaining or dropping the material part. I think they must be thinking about karma, <laughs> if, if the authors drop all their material parts. And we continue, okay? All entities bounded by any material entity in three-dimensional regions are classified as disaster management ontology upper class sites. Houses, stations, centers, words, and states are in this class. The house is located in space and is bounded by a material entity. So the existence of a house is fully dependent on its wall. So these entities are specifically dependent continuant. <coughs> specifically, comma, dependent continuant is a category of BFO, comma, completely dependent on its surrounding boundary. Barry, you have a lot of frequent flyer miles. Get your ass up there <laughs> and tell them what's wrong. Second one, confusion between BFO and the oboe foundry. Right, originally I thought that the Oboe Foundry was created to uh, put on some principles on ontology development, right? And in addition to some others. And I know that, that, that Barry is on the basis of it. And the idea, as it is still there, basic formal ontology, the upper level ontology upon which Oboe Foundry ontologies are built. Not, it's not anymore the case. So this, for instance, is the disease ontology. Where is continuant and occurrent and dependent and independent? It's nowhere there. I mean, it's, it's a collection, the same kind of nonsense, right, that we have been living with for 30 years. There's a relation ontology. Well, it has its basis in this paper where several of authors are here in, in the room also, um, which actually was a beautiful a uh, piece about how relations should be formed and that distinction between relations at particular level and relations at type level. Now you have the relation ontology. Right? How many relations that BFO has maybe have maybe 12 if you don't count the, uh, the inverses? Here there are 643. And now you have just going to read it if it is so small as well. You have relations, right? Disease has inflammation site. Disease has feature. Disease arises from alteration in structure. Disease has basis in dysfunction. And so on, and so on, and so on. So I hope that they will never start on working on a surgery ontology. Because then there might be a relation between surgery, a surgeon and a body fart, for instance, has carefully checked 
the status of the sterilization of the scalpel before cutting into. Right? So I can see there might be a point maybe there. If you are in Finland or Germany or maybe in Flanders, okay, where the grammar of the language allows you to express the man around the counter with the, around the corner with a yellow handkerchief in his left pocket, you can express that in one word. Right? So maybe for those languages there might be a point, but honestly I don't think it is correct. And there is the excuse of we need shortcut relations. Was it Alan who came up with that idea of shortcut relations? Yeah, I think it's a little bit cutting too, uh, too far. That's cutting corners. There's so much cutting corners that actually nothing is left of what you are cutting the corners off. Now why am I so upset about it? And why do you think that I'm entitled to say those not nice things? Because I made the same mistakes. Right? These are some views that I was very proud of in uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it was actually based, you might recognize something, it was based on uh, region connection calculus and the extended versions where you just know that ovals, but uh, also things like glasses where you could put stuff uh, inside without really being inside it. Well, might be impressive, but it's all wrong. So, look at this, okay? Barry was supposed to be the smith of the foundry. But look at this picture. And if you take the smith away, what's left? A very dirty place. A very dirty place. All right. Well, what happened there? I think Fabian is right. This next presentation. Right? Basic formal ontology, it's all over the place. It's in 35 different pa uh, papers in which different, slightly different things are said. It comes in different versions, like now there is the actualization in first order logic, there is the one in AL, which is a watered down version without temporal indexing. And I, yeah, I understand it might lead to a confusion, specifically confusion that those who don't understand the real value of what is really expressed in the philosophical principles, they can do it with BFO1, because it exists and BFO created it. I think, I think that's not not a good thing, but okay. Another pet peeve. How too much used as an exchange format rather than a language with formal semantics. Very interesting paper as well. On Beyond Gruber, ontologies in today's biomedical information systems and the limits of AL. It's actually a written out version of the keynote that Alan Rector gave in uh, ICDO 2018 in, uh, where was it? There in the north of England, close to uh, Scotland, Newcastle. Okay, it contains a very nice history of how how was developed, how it grew out of uh, frame systems. Like it discusses the uh, feasible knowledge and invariance and all that stuff. It explains it really nicely. Uh, what the issues are, what you can use AL for, and what you cannot use it for. If you look at the bio portal, I have only discovered one ontology that didn't. Didn't did anything wrong to the L semantics, and that's the psychology ontology. And why is that? Because they have 6,000 classes, 6,000 axioms, and all those axioms are is subclass of our thing. So <laughs> it's it's a very long list of an ontology of psychology. They didn't make any mistake. <laughs> Existing tools make it too easy to make something that looks like an ontology, for instance, protege, and reuse content from something that looks like an ontology. And then you get something worse, like, like robots. Like, perhaps you are right, halfway right, and say, well, you can't blame the, blame the tools when they are not used correctly. Right? But what is all this fuss about guns than about? And the martial, right? You can't blame can't blame the guns, it's the people. Biggest frustration. Students in my 700 level classes still make basic mistakes concerning basic formal ontology principles, and I mean now the philosophical part. Now of course you can say, well that's because you are a lousy teacher. Maybe, <laughs> uh, 
Maybe. <laughs> I, I don't think. I don't think it is. So, uh, is there a step towards improvement? I think that BFO twenty twenty and specifically the axiomatization in, in first order logic and Cliff is actually a major step forward. And honestly, Fabian, I have to apologize. I had absolutely no clue that you did something like this already for BFO one point one. I believe bad marketing because I didn't know about it. <laughs> so. <coughs> There is something in not in balance here, right? So what I wanted to show on this slide is actually how my life is formed out of our certain people who I consider mentors, specifically those those two here. And there's something missing in the right upper corner. Big applause to uh, Alan. He made it. So <laughs> and now secondly, because the contribution of Paul Kleskens was important, but not too much. I put up my father there because my father always supported me when I behaved like an asshole or the pain in the neck. Because he said that's not a problem. As long as you have good foundational grounds to motivate why you be, why you behave like a pain in the neck. So, BFO 2020 Cliff, you can find it uh, on uh, GitHub. I'm not sure whether many people looked at it. I'm quite sure everybody went immediately to the .out files. Um, there is, if you don't know that much about Cliff, there is a standard about common logic that you can download. And there is an annex there which explains the Cliff of the common logic in the JIC format, where it came from, the full syntactic and the semantics, uh, and so on. Now, BFO 2020 doesn't use everything what you can uh, express in Cliff. So it uses only parts of that. Um, this expressed in first order logic, with important features being the use of equality. You have up to a ternary predicates. There are no functions. Uh, you have the standard collectives. You have universal and extensional quantification. And you have what I call the realism based choice of predicates. So what are realism based predicates? Restricted to formal relations, you don't lump everything together as now is being done in the uh, relation ontology. Uh, grounded in that distinction between types and particulars, and importantly use of temporal indexing where it is required. Okay. So the distinction, uh, all soccer balls are round. You can do that in first order logic, but very calls are logically conceived by for all x, if soccer ball x round x. Why is it phantomologically? Because you are actually saying the x uh, twice things are according to the basic formal ontology, actually two different entities. So what you would get is for all x and t, if instance of x soccer ball t exists y, an instance of y round t, and in here is in y x. Deflated soccer balls are not round, no problem for phantologists to create deflated soccer ball and you create not round if you don't want to be bothered by negation. Of course you can do it in different ways. In every language you can say things in different ways. Okay. Realism based on qualities, no. You should not cram everything together in a predicate. You need to think. Thinking seems to be the biggest problem currently at universities. You have to feel. You are not allowed to think. Uh, anymore, unless everybody feels right about it. So you need to think and you need to apply logic in the right way and you need to combine it with ontology in the right way. That's what we are going to. Now, why do you think, or why do I think that it is a possible improvement? Okay. So, I think that the axiomatization makes it easier to grasp what BFO really says about reality. And, and honestly, it says way less and way more than I thought. Okay. So, I've been trying, like I will explain, develop parser and uh, reasoner to work directly with the uh, uh, BFO axioms. And when you are developing such things, and something doesn't work out the way that you think it should work out, where is the problem? Is the problem in the ontology? Is the problem in your tool? 
or is there actually no problem but you yourself have the wrong conception about what actually is said and is not said in the basic form of the world. I think you can seriously use it to improve the quality of ontology design. And I was very happy that I already saw the paper for 2019, Fabian was with it, do I pronounce it right? The guy Flugel, who created something and he found uh, even in the OPI, which is actually one of the very few ontologies who deserves to be in the open foundry, but it was even in the OPI. There was an axiom that violated actually what was expressed in the first order logic in BFO. So you can detect inconsistency, you can identify unintended consequences, and also you can improve the quality of information systems specifically electronic healthcare records and repositories, which is actually not more my area of working. And that helps you leveraging reference tracking, an idea that Barry and I advanced in 2005, but it never took really off. And I think that's not <coughs> part of me justified. So what is reference tracking? It's something that we borrowed from language. So in, in not language processing, it is now. And you have the reference, an entity denoted by some reference in the representation, a reference, a representation that denotes some entity. The reference tracking is an actually keeping track of how entity stands in relation to each other and how the references are used in representations. So in language, uh, it's known under different names. They are not exactly equivalent, but they all deal with the same problem like reference resolution, co-reference resolution, and FRI resolution. I think this is a, a beautiful example. My child doesn't like fish. What replacement would you suggest? Oh, the cat would work. All cats like fish. <laughs> now, what is the problem in electronic health care? Right? So in the back end, we have tables. So some of the systems which is used in Buffalo here has like 65,000. Well, there's tables behind it which are connected in different ways. Made a simplified version. You have an identifier for a patient. You have some data. The data is in European format because I'm carrying over these slides since I was still in Europe. You have a concept code. It's an identifier, in this case from Snow and CT. And then you have the term, uh, which is the, the label of what the term actually means. So usually when I have doctors in the room, I ask them how many different disorders do you see? And I use disorder in the most general way. They usually talk about conditions. And to make it easy, you may do not include accident in public health. And then I start to think and think, and then I start to get, you know, 5, 14, 11, 9. Well, the correct answer is actually, it's impossible to tell. It's absolutely impossible to tell. And why? Well, look, see, here you're the same patient, you have the same date, different codes. One is closed fracture of shaft of femur, and the other one is fractured closed spine. Now, would you assume that that person has two fractures? Might be. You can't tell. I think in this case, it's a clinician who was a little bit smarter than all the others. They said, actually, that patient has a closed spiral fracture of the shaft of the femur, but unfortunately, my ontology does not have one code for that term. So I need to use two. See, the spiral is missing in the other one. Um, and there are many, many more examples. For instance, if the same patient, okay, have several years later, or again, no fracture of the shaft of the femur. Now, you might say, yeah, probably that might be a, uh, a new fracture, because seven years later must be a new fracture. Yeah, but it might also be a reiteration of the diagnosis that we have for And if you say, well, the date is important, what are you going to do with fractures after two months? Okay. Are they always healed or are they not healed? And so on. So you actually, you can't. You can't tell. You need more than that. So you can translate this, of course, in uh, phantology. And the first question actually already is already useful. What should you make as a medical? Should you, so does this represent as disorder? John has a disorder fracture at date one, or so it should be understood as John has a diagnosis of fracture at date one. Okay, those are two different things. That's exactly that distinction again between 
what is the case and what is said about what is the case. Second most important thing to what precisely is fracture prescribed. Everything in medical records is described about the patient. There is actually not explicitly anything said about disorders or diseases or whatever. You find it in notes, in free language, you don't find it in the structure of the presentation. So reference tracking is about being explicit, making explicit reference to individual entities, okay, and do that consistently. You don't do it with words, but you do it with numbers. And what you try to do is make your identifiers globally and singularly unique, which means that for the globally and singularly unique part, it means there is for any particular only one identifier within all systems in which the entity is represented. Singularly unique means there is for any particular only one identifier within a given representation system. And the basic rule for RT-based information systems would then be accept only assertions about explicitly identified particles. And that's not actually so difficult to do. Okay? In a table like this, the only thing that you need to do is to replace this column by these two. Okay, you have your identifiers there. And those identifiers are identifiers for what is happening in reality. And now you can use your terms as annotations. Okay? This then actually corresponds that this is an instance of that. So, and why is that? Because if you only look at the genetic terms in electronic healthcare records, you only see that surface. So you can see a time T1 B9 tumor, a time T2 malignant tumor. What you do not see is what is underneath it, right? So in this case, there is only one tumor. Okay, and he became malignant at time T2 while he was not malignant at time T1. But all the time, of course, he was in that poor guy's stomach. So here you have exactly the same thing that you would see in the regular. But the underlying situation is different. Okay, you have two different instances. One existed in T1, another one at T2. This one might still exist as well. Both are in the, uh, the record preference, but you can't see what the difference is. Here the two next to each other. Okay, you see the same part, what you see in the record. The underlying situation is completely different. Uh, this is another case. Um, this is a look at the problem list um, of a uh, record here in hospital. The same patient information that we had starting from day one up to day 2317, so about six years and a half or so. Um, maintaining a problem list is a requirement uh, in the United States. What's happening here? All right. <coughs> must have been a mistake on the slide. Um, so here, in the course of uh, the patient's evolution, there were four problems registered. Okay? You also see who registered. Well, if you know how to read those different symbols here, but the D uh, is actually, sorry, the actor in the upper corner here, the C's are the person. So you see that there is a, there we don't know who did it. Okay? Then we have here, a C1, we have a C2, and so on. So different doctors actually, C4, C3, who made different statements about this patient. Now for a doctor, this is not that much of a problem. For a machine, it is a problem. Okay, what, now what is the problem? Uh, so you have a first problem, pre-diabetes, and now later, you have a second problem, which is impaired fasting glucose. Now impaired fasting glucose is actually just another way of saying the guy has pre-diabetes, but we found it out uh, by applying a specific method. So now you see that at day 426, there is a third problem, which is diabetes mellitus. But how can you have at the same time pre-diabetes and diabetes? It doesn't, it doesn't, make, any, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Now doctors actually, they could see this. Honestly, I don't know whether they can see it. It depends on the interface of the electronic healthcare record system. Of but it is in the database. Now somebody must have seen it because at some point, here you see the R here, which was registered as being a mistake. But then again, yeah, what does it mean to have been a mistake? Uh, it might have very well be that when at this point in time they tested the glucose, that it was really as a level that you should say, uh, yeah, well, this patient has diabetes. It might also be that it was just one unlucky find and the next day. It was already back normal. He might have lied. 
it might not have fastened, right? You'll get your high glucose, and there you go. So things like this need to be cleaned up. Okay? Reference tracking, I believe, can clean that up if you do everything in the right way. We find that also in the definitions, in textual definitions, that we find the classification systems, terminologies, and so on. So this one is from the International Classification for Headache Disorders. Okay? So we have a term which is called persistent idiopathic facial pain. And the textual definition, at least the part which is relevant here, is a persistent facial pain with varying presentations. Now, that system is to be used by doctors when they have a patient in front of them. Okay, they need to be able to tell you, well, this patient, should I classify this as a patient with persistent idiopathic facial pain, or should I not? That's their job. That's what their systems are developed for. So now look at this. Okay, so you have Persistent facial pain, and presentation type 1, type 2, type 3, and so on. This is at the level of the types. And now imagine three people. Somebody with my pain, somebody with her pain, somebody with his pain. Now, the guy with my pain, me, at all the time that the pain exists, it's persistent facial pain, and it is always of this presentation type. So for the, this guy here, this pain, it's similar. So all the time, persistent facial pain, whenever it is present, it is, all, it is of presentation type. Your presentation type is like throbbing or stabbing or whatever, those kind of uh, qualifiers that are given. And then her pain is such that the persistent facial pain is always there, but that T1 it is of that type, and uh, time 2 it is of that type, and so on. Which of the three instances of pain quantify for persistent idiopathic facial pain? Well, it depends on how you interpret that definition. Is it a statement about the types, or is it a statement about particulars? Okay. If it is a statement about type, okay, then all three qualify. If it is a statement that you need to interpret at the level of particulars, then it's only this pain which qualifies for it. So you can do a predicate analog, of course, of uh, uh, these situations, which at least make it clear um, what the distinctions is between the two situations. Um, in this format, okay, it will be hard to get into traditional electronic medical records, but you can do it in a table format and give it the interpretation uh, as it is of, like this. I had for years such a hard time to talk about referent tracking to Alan. And always when I came up with some one or other way of doing the notation, Alan always said, I don't understand what you mean. I don't understand what you mean. And then he became author of this paper, the author, right? Where they have some table talk. This is the, the schema. And this is then part of the expressions that are in there. Well, Alan, you have been doing reference tracking without knowing. <laughs> because that's exactly what it is about. All those things are uniquely identified. Right? And you have your logic there. Uh, by the way, so the table talk is about a table that loses its function and for which a leg is to be replaced. It's not this table, because this is a piece of art. That, that's on purpose. You, you, you pay way more for a table like that than for a regular table. So the other question, can I use PFO Cliff to provide better education? Okay, so I started to design some, some tools. So I uh, distilled from the way that uh, Alan uh, produced, sorry, no, uh, made the Cliff files available a template, which I call the BFO 2020 style template. Um, I designed a parcel which has various error checking functions. And I was, well, I can't say that I was happy to discover mistakes in the CL files when I downloaded them first. They were quickly cleared by uh, Alan. But it does it, it gives warnings. Uh, it can track ontology dependencies when you combine three files from uh, several ontologies. And does conversion to a couple of formats. Uh, the one that I'm using is actually the uh, two words, the Kowalski rules. 
because that fits nicely with the style of reasoning that I was taught when I did my degree in arts engineering in the 80s. Okay? Then there were expert systems were fancy, and one of the expert systems were production rule systems. So when you transform fully into a Kowalski rules, you can get there. Not without problems, but you can get there. Oh, this is an example of uh, one of the BFO axioms uh, in Glyph. Definition of specifically dependent continuant. Uh, this is roughly how the, well, not roughly, it's actually like precisely uh, what the BFO 2020 style Glyph template is about. So you have, start with your CL command, you have some text about what you say what it is for. You have another piece of text here in which you can give a title. And then you have your uh, discourse statements, which actually are all the predicates that are used in that specific CL file. Uh, and now you have a series of, again, comments in which you have your clauses. So Alan uses there the definition of the uh, axio plus at the end uh, an index which is unique for that uh, action. So what is that conversion? There are techniques on how to go from first order logic to close a normal form to now from there to Kowalski. So that previous uh, statement or that previous action get transformed uh, in this way. Of course, this is again a particular notation that I used. Uh, I'm a prolog fanatic. A lot of people probably will use other stuff. So this is something that can directly read into Prolog and can reason when you have the appropriate meta interpreter. Okay. Uh, one of the important elements uh, that you see here are these things. So although the actions themselves, they have no functions, but when you do your conversions, and for everything that after the uh, transformation still becomes or stays existentially quantified, you have to replace it by either a scope constant or a scope function. Uh, and those scope functions, are actually a, a pain in the neck, in, in my neck. They, you can't avoid them, <laughs> but they are difficult. Uh, when you do this kind of transformation, um, it is guaranteed that when the original axioms are unsatisfiable, then this is unsatisfiable. But you may lose a little bit of validity because the interpretation of the scope of cost of the functions is not exactly the same. It, sli it slightly changes the semantics. The difference actually being that in the action you would say there exists something such, and when you do it in this way, then you say it is that that exists. Okay. So there are five types of Kowalski rules. Uh, call it if-then rules, so you have a, a conjunction as antecedent, and then a single consequent. But you can also have true there, and you have a simple fact. You have the then or rules, a conjunction of something, and then a P or a Q, and so on. And also, you can have true. So no specific antecedent, then you have the fact, of course, alternative facts. And then you have falsehood rules. We simply say the conjunction of this and this and this. That's not uh, possible. If you ignore this, if you only work with this, then you have pure prolog. Okay? So you will cut things out, and I, I'm not saying that no, you can cut those things out because then you are making a similar mistake as using out, right? But you could already do a very useful thing with this in pure prolog. If you want to use this, you need to do some more uh, clever program. So current reasoning modes that I'm using in the reason, there is the classical propositional ones, but then including with those variables and those scoring functions out there. I had to do some possible world approach as well, because some of the axioms are really weird, uh, formulated, logically correct, okay, but uh, really uh, difficult to deal with, and now some heuristics specifically to limit function embedding, otherwise you go very quickly into uh, Circles, specifically the scroll function. Is the scroll function get embedded in another one and again and again and again? So you don't stop. So I can limit that by putting certain uh, input parameters and also some things to attain uh, incompleteness. Uh, the first time I tried to do the very simple thing uh, instance of t occurrent t1. And the system didn't stop. It stopped. Because 
of the way certain axioms were formulated. So why possible worlds is this, and then you find that quite, a, quite often. So uh, you have this, uh, uh, this junction here, the or, so that if A participates in B and T, then A is either an even continuum, but not a spatial region, specifically de or specifically dependent or generically dependent continuum. So of course this is an or, but actually it would be better specify some exclusive or. That's like immediately the meaning that we get because none of these can be any of that. If it's this, it cannot be that and so on. Right? Uh, logically not in Rome, but XOR would be better. So if you transform that to close a normal form and then to uh, Kowalski, so then you get the things that indeed you would expect. So here also it's still not an exclusive or, but you get this clause which actually says if A is an instance of spatial region of C, then it's either an instance, and this is the case, then it's either an instance of generically dependent continuum, or it's an instance of general specifically dependent Now, of course, this thing will never happen. Right? If you do everything, maybe that is. Because it cannot, spatial region cannot, according to the axiom, uh, participate in it. But I couldn't figure it out, at least my reasoner couldn't figure it out with the classical reasoning schemes. So then I had to uh, design some mechanism of possible worlds, try an assumption it, put it in a possible world, reason as much as you can. If you have a, uh, uh, what's it? I don't find the word now. Um, inconsistency, if you get an inconsistency, okay, your assumption or so, take the next one, and so on. And at the same time, try to reason with everything what is already proven in your base world, plus what is in your possible world, but then you even inconsistency. So the input that I use is pretty much what you can uh, find in uh, standard uh, databases, the only exception being the front here. So I can put in as data true or false. And actually meaning, this is the case that John is an instance of object at MT. If it would be false, then it would be, it is not the case that the tumor of John is a proper continuum part of John at T1, and, and so on. So you give it to the reasoner, nano bugger, inconsistency. Right, well, that's exactly what we want. Because what actually happened, this example that I give here, uh, it's because the student gave in tumor of job cancer at T1, at T2, tumor of job B9 tumor at T1. Uh, OGMS says that that will be the case. Thus, uh, B9 tumor is an object, cancer is a disease. It's something which is object cannot be a disease. So what you then actually get is uh, this nice output. You have to add the colors, of course, of visibility, but it's produced in a CSV. And it gives you the entire reasoning chain, going from the instances okay, up to the inconsistency. Now you have to read this. So these are the input facts. So there were more facts that were given as input. The three and four gave rise to an inconsistency. Okay. You then see that, for instance, uh, four was used in this axiom. This axiom that produced some rule with the number 217. Okay, four gave fact eight. Eight is used here. Used another rule which was derived from that axiom. 60 goes here. And then here we end up in the axioms of uh, the basic formula. So it is, it is really, it is really nice. It makes people see, okay, there is something wrong. Explanation. Uh, OGMS is currently not uh, formally actually advertised, so I made a little uh, mock-up here in which I expressed that cancer is a disease and diseases are dispositions, and that disorders are material entities and B9 tumors are disorders. And if you combine that with the action from the above, then you can get the uh, inconsistency. Uh, this is another example that I've been working on with uh, uh, Michael, who is sitting in the back, Michael said that. He, he's, my, he's my delightful pain in the neck. <coughs> he has been working on uh, kinship ontology. There are a couple of uh, kinship ontologies around. We want to give a realism based interpretation of it, which is not that easy to do. And we combined it with uh, information that the student of Alex is using. Other one is Alex? Oh, okay. 
So uh, Anamat is working on a colonial carcinoma uh, ontology, specifically on data that he got from the Thailand government. He's a public health officer who is uh, paid by Thailand to do a PhD in bioinformatics. So one of the stories there is uh, that all over Thailand they uh, have a huge problem with uh, colonial carcinomas because of uh, Stortis figurine, which is one of those little worms. Uh, and at some stage, they get in the gold water. Uh, they produce toxins, they produce uh, cancer, uh, and so on. So there is a huge effort there for uh, trying to map what is happening. There's all the certain areas that we need to uh, apply some preventive measures. So uh, one of the things is uh, they have forms, and in one of the forms, there are questions related to whether relevant relatives have uh, colonial carcinoma or not. A different kind of relatives are specified, like is it, a, is it a parent, or is it an uncle, or an aunt, or a grandparent, or spouse, and so on. So that's the reason why we, we did that. Now, we, for some of those um, persons who were in the database, we found that there were uh, more than one what they call an intake form, uh, which actually is described where this is the same situation uh, now and then several years later, that patient might end up in another hospital. They didn't check whether he was already in the official system. At that point in time, they made four, the data were entered there, and then after which it was recognized as uh, being of that very same patient, but they didn't look into it any deeper. So we applied the kinship ontology with a few other things, uh, related to the presence of a coagular carcinoma in the relative. And we got for a couple of patients this uh, inconsistency there, which actually is a simple one. But anyhow, it was at some point stated that there was uh, one of the parents had coagular carcinoma. And then at a later, four years later, it was stated that no parent had a coagular carcinoma. Okay. Now, of course, you might say, well, that's a little bit uh, over the top. But you very easily use an excellent spreadsheet to check for those things. Yeah, it's true. Okay, but in the, uh, the overall idea that at some point when you have a very good reference tracking based information system, you don't need to do the checks. The backgrounds can be done by checks of, of this kind based on the ontology. Another thing here, I wanted to go into deeper analysis, but I can't. But those of you who go to voice, I got a paper accepted where I'm try to uh, make like a nice logic-based system where I combine um, the realism-based ontology with SNOMED CT, which is actually not at all realism-based. So according to SNOMED CT, uh, I am not an object. I am a social entity. Now, the, the last thing that you can say about this is that I'm a social entity. It's, it's, it's rather an anti-social entity. But okay. So uh, it works also. And there I introduced another relation, which is individual of, which is like uh, um, no time indexed instance of for continuance, <laughs> because that's how they deal with it. What do I need to do? OK, I don't need to make the tools foolproof. I need to continue uh, debugging. I'm quite sure the parser is fine for the users. Once in a while, I still find some issues. Better control of the scrollable functions. Try to see whether it is possible to work. Uh, to avoid it for certain axioms, creation minimal models, building nice timelines, part of the type taxonomies, uh, input queries. So I, I didn't do that yet, but there's an easy alternative. You input the logical opposite of this, and if you get an uh, inconsistency, well, <laughs> and it's true. And the cliff style data input, that's not a problem at all, actually. But it, uh, it is a way to say things which you cannot say currently in the electronic health care record system in the standard way. For instance, that there was no time that the tumor of John was not in. Okay. And you can't do it with pure reference tracking uh, as well. So the final part, good, bad, or ugly, I'm not going to go there. I'm simply going to say what I like and what I don't like. What I very much like is that it exists. Okay. This is a really, for me, I, I consider it a new phase in my life. But I always have thought in terms of, of seven years. So for seven years, I should do something else. But I always think you should do that, but you can never get an expert in something else, right? <laughs> I like to change. So uh, the seven years are almost done, over. 
right? in the sense that the Department of Biomedical Informatics was created. So, so and now suddenly Alan came, <laughs> and I was so close before my retirement, he came up, he came up with that. So I, I can't read that. But I like it for someone to take, okay? So you can't imagine the, the weeks that I have lost by thinking that there was a mistake in my reason and, and why certain things didn't work. For instance, the simple thing, so I am in uh, room one and my brain is in room two and room one uh, is, there are no parts in common between room one and room two to give an ecosystem. Right, no ecosystem. Looking and checking, adding some things that never worked out. But they're like, my idea was only well, you can't be in two different places at the same time. Well, for the heck you can. It'd be a road. Because now space can be part of the other one. Right? But that's at the level of the spatial region. Okay? So you need to go through that entire spatial can be reasonably and have to do object things and where you are located in and so on. If you remember what was said about the house located in space in that first paper, they often have a hard time to, to prove their things. So yes, of course, it is possible if they overlap. There are similar things with, uh, with time. I think I put it out here. Yes, okay, particulars are allowed to come out and back in existence. So uh, it is perfectly possible that you say that I exist at T1 and I exist at T3 and I don't exist at T2. Okay, and T1 is preceded by T1 and T2 beside precedes T3. You don't get any inconsistency. Okay. Uh, now I can imagine that Alan has been watching Star Trek and can be later, right? But <laughs> and in that scenario, yeah, maybe maybe there will be at some point an invention where that is possible. But at least I think we should have some kind of a category where you say, well. For most material entities in this day and age, if they are gone, they are gone. And they can't come back into existence. What I dislike in the first place is that change in time index. Okay, it doesn't, uh, the axiomatization doesn't adhere to the original uh, principle. The principle was if in the relation at least one of the arguments is a continuum, time indexing is required. Okay? And if in the relation only occurrence are involved, no time indexing. Um, I'll change. And, and I agree. I mean, logically, there is no problem. Right? You, can do it, you can do it either way. But I don't like it. It specifically, in, uh, specifically depends on, as an example, Birov, it hears it. And for, of the other one, instance of one occurrent at T. Right? So I think that should be, that should be changed, honestly. And if he doesn't do it, then at some point, I don't think so. To, uh, to um, I need to be careful with this, what I consider useless truths. Uh, for instance, the action that is always something that exists. Um, it's a pain in the neck for, <coughs> for a reason. Now, okay, now I'm making the mistake that the uh, old fundamentalists are making, right? Time indexing is a pain in the neck, so just the truth. I, I might not make that mistake, but as far I haven't seen any, any scenario that I have been able to give where that would have given any useful information. Uh, in light of those uh, uh, scholar uh, functions, okay, this one is extremely annoying because it generates okay, two different ones. Okay. And if you look at, uh, I keep also tracking the reason what kind of scholars are created and how are they composed of. So you see that E9 is actually abundantly present without actually giving any information. Now that is good. Okay, why is that good? Maybe I can find a way to uh, do a second reasoning on all of those column formations here and then make a decision on, okay, which are the rules which are possibly not doing any decent work. So, and, and eliminate them. Uh, there is some redundancy uh, in the CL files. Uh, okay, logically, nothing wrong again there but you need to process it in your parser, you get additional rules, you need to detect whether they are the same or not, and the problem is again in the scholar function, because one of the rules is each time that you do it, you need to have another function. So that you should already have some reasoning in your parser to be able to avoid it. Pain in the neck. 
Final suggestion that I have, and I think quite at the end. Oh yeah, uh, other typology of universals. Okay, uh, Nicola Guarino had that already very early, and honestly, the way that he presented it, I, I didn't understand. That would be useful. But now, now I do because there are a couple of examples. Uh, for instance, uh, in Brexit is an example. So. So clinicians start now to <coughs> in terms of uh, disorders which are some kind, I don't remember what the term for this, but some continuant uh, kind of thing. So which means you can have a certain disorder like Brexit, Brexit is like clenching your feet. And when it is a little bit, there is no problem when you have it uh, in a very hard degree, then uh, you quickly soon start to look like the teeth of the singer of the post before we had its uh, uh, treatment. Um, so diseases like that, they say they come in certain kind of gradations. Okay. Compare it with temperatures. Okay, so you have the notion of temperature, you can have a subtype temperature of 37 and temperature of 38. That's how you want to be involved. If you look at it, then you see the order in a certain way. So you solve it uh, currently by having a relation which is completely ordered. But based on that idea of Ingvar Johansson, that at universals you should look, you can look at them, but also look through them. If you look through them, then you see what is the case for the individuals. Now if you look through temperature, then you see that they are temperature more. So maybe there is a way that uh, adding a specific typology in so it's like the AVO that can do that. So I think that's it. Unfortunately, there is not that much time for questions, but I to the screen of it if you have any. Go ahead. Um, so I'm interested in the quality.